Well, for some answer, they learned to use for speak on metaphors in Socratic philosophy. Okay. Um, yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's nice spending the year here at the Institute. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the area of systolic geometry. And my goal is just to, gi is to give an introduction to this area. So I'm going to assume you know nothing about it at all and try to give um, some flavor of the area, what the main results are and, and difficulties and what some of the main ideas are. Um, OK. So systolic geometry began with a theorem from the late 40s that was proven by Charles Lovner. Um, He proved that if you take any metric G on a two-dimensional torus, um, then you can find a curve in the torus. There exists a curve, gamma, contained in the torus, which is not contractible. And where the length of gamma is not too long. So it's bounded by um, a constant times the area of the torus um, to the 1 half power. And Lovner fin figured out what this constant is. Um, it's the square root of 2 divided by the fourth root of 3, which is approximately 1.1. OK, so to get a feeling for, for what this theorem means, um, I drew some pictures of tori. Mm. So if you're, if you're even very unfamiliar with Riemannian geometry, I think the talk should still be understandable. And what a Riemannian metric on a torus means is that there's some topological two-dimensional torus in space, and it could be curved in any arbitrary way. So here are some pictures of two-dimensional tori in R3. This one is meant to be a torus of rotation. It's not, very, uh, not particularly precise. Um, and so. For example, there's a non-contractible curve in this torus, which is around there. Um, and if you pick, if you pick uh, dimensions for this thing, you can compute how long the curve is, and you can compute the area and check that this inequality is true. Um, and then you can consider deforming that torus in different ways. And the theorem says that no matter how you deform it, the inequality is still true. And for these particular ways of deforming it, we can kind of check by hand that this is true. Um, so what I did here is I made the torus a lot skinnier and a lot longer. Um, and when you do that, um, well, when you make it skinnier, the systole gets smaller. And so that's all to the good. And when you make the torus longer, the area gets bigger, and it doesn't change the systole. So that's all to the good. Um, so this inequality is certainly going to be still be true for a longer and skinnier torus. Another thing you could do is you could stick some kind of uh, spike out the edge of your torus. Um, if you do that, um, the systolic inequality is still true, and the systole maybe you could choose here. And this spike doesn't really make it any bigger, and it adds to the area of the torus. And so the inequality is still true. Um, another thing you could do is instead of having a nice, a nice even thickness of your tube, you could have a thickness of your tube that varies. Um, and that's also harmless, because the systole will be measured using the thinnest part of your oscillating tube. And all of the thicker parts are just accumulating onto the area. So the inequality would still be true for something like this. So if you, if you play around with different shapes like this, and maybe on your own a little bit, a little bit more, it will feel very plausible that an inequality like this is true. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so, um, OK, so it's nice that he has the sharp constant. But the main thing that's of interest to me is that the ratio is bounded, as you say. Um, and so this is a rough reason why, why that's true. Um, this is still not a proof that that's true. But um, in practice, I have trouble thinking of metrics on a two-dimensional torus that are any, really any weirder than these metrics. And so for most statements that I consider about a two-dimensional torus, I'll check it for those. And if it's true, I'll at least expect that it's probably true. Um, so this is not a proof, but it might give some intuition that this is a plausible inequality. Is, it, is that the constant just sharp for a flat torus? Yes, 
This is sharp for a flat hexagonal torus. Yeah. Another class of examples that is very sensible to check is the flat tori, which are formed by taking a parallelogram and identifying opposite sides. And it's also not very hard to check by hand that some inequality like this is true for all flat tori. And with a little bit more work, you can check that the worst flat torus is the hexagonal one. And you can compute that this is what happens for the hexagonal torus. OK. Um, uh, I'm not big on definitions, but the, there's one definition in this field, which is the definition of the word systole. So the systole of a Riemannian manifold is defined to be the length of the shortest non-contractible non-contractible curve. So if we want to, we can rewrite Lovner's theorem using, using the word systole. And it says that the systole of a two-dimensional torus is less than or equal to this constant times the area to the power of 1 half. OK, so that's the setup. This was done in the late 40s. And it raised a natural question, which is whether something similar is true in higher dimensions. And that question about higher dimensions was open for a long time. It was open for a little more than 30 years. And the answer turns out to be yes. It was proven by Gromov in the early 80s. So let me write that down. So theorem uh, Gromov 83. So for any metric g on an n-dimensional torus, OK, so I should say there exists some constant cn for any n. And then for any metric g on this n-dimensional torus, the systole of tng is less than or equal to this constant times the volume to the power 1 over n. So the constant C2 is the constant that Lovner found, which comes from the hexagonal flat torus, and it's sharp. These other constants are not sharp, the ones that we know. Um, and there's not, there's not even a good guess, really, what the best constant should be. Um, it's not known that flat tori aren't the best. But it's not known, it's also obviously not known that they are the best. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's tempting. Maybe that, that one is particularly nice. Maybe that, but we have no idea for the correct case. OK, so this is, I would say, the main theorem of systolic geometry. And it's going to be the central theorem that I'm going to talk about all through my talk. Now, there's a big gap in, in time between the late 40s, when the two-dimensional case was done, and the 80s, when the three-dimensional case was done. And I want to talk about um, why, the th why getting to three dimensions is a lot harder. Um, so, so basically, first of all, basically what's striking about both of these theorems is that there are no restrictions on the metric G. There are a lot of problems in my area of Riemannian geometry that say, if you have a metric G and also it's sectional curvature obeys this inequality, then something, something. Right? But we have no restriction like that. It's for absolutely any metric G. And it's what, it's, there's not very many theorems that hold in this generality, at least if they have any kind of oomph or, or any trickiness. Now, in particular, when we get to three dimensions and higher, um, it's looking at all of the possible metrics on a three-dimensional torus is a huge set. And the, the difficulty is just that there are so many metrics and such strange metrics to contend with. First of all, it's hard to draw useful pictures in higher dimensions. Um, but, but um, OK, so th there are some kind of analogs of these things in three dimensions. You could have a three-dimensional flat torus to which you attach some kind of spike and so on. But in addition to that kind of thing, there's a lot of other stuff that starts to happen in three dimensions, which is not analogous to any of the pictures that we can easily draw. 
Yes, that's right. So the proof of Levner's theorem uses the uniformization theorem, and then he has a um, clever little argument that shows that the original uh, systolic ratio is um, worse than the systolic ratio for the flat guy, and then you analyze by hand what happens for the flat guys. Um, and another thing that, that definitely stops happening when you go from two to three dimensions is that you stop having the uniformization theorem. Um, and no, there's no substitute for it. OK, so it's hard to picture metrics. Metrics can be more complicated. Um, if you do Riemannian geometry and you think about curvature, the curvature is given by a number in two dimensions. And it's given by a vector with six components in three dimensions. So it's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's not directly relevant, but it's some sense of how hard it is to picture curved three-dimensional surfaces. But let, let me give you some examples of strange metrics that one has to contend with. Um, so example one, um, for any number b, which could get arbitrarily big, there is a metric I'll call g sub b on a three-dimensional torus. And it has the following properties. The volume of this metric, g sub b, is equal to 1. But um, if you look at, if uh, you take a surface, sigma 2, in your torus, so which is any, um, any homologically non-trivial surface, which looks to be the right analog of a non-contractible curve. Um, so if you look at any homologically non-trivial surface, the area of this surface is at least b. Okay. And this number b can be arbitrarily big. And so it means there's, there's no analog of the systolic inequality that allows you to bound a two-dimensional area in terms of the three-dimensional volume of the torus. Um, a second example in a similar spirit is that um, for any b um, going to infinity, there's another metric, g sub b, which is on S2 cross S2. And <clears throat> it has the property that the four-dimensional volume of this metric, g sub b, is again 1. And, um, and this, is, this is true verbatim. So any homologically non-trivial surface in that S2 cross S2 has a huge area. Um, OK, so these show that if you took the systolic inequality and generalized it to higher dimensions in a different way, you would get something which is wrong. Um, and they're basically the kind of metrics that we have to be worried about. Um, I'm sorry, what do you mean describe? These are not that hard to describe. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Let me, um, let me come back at the end if I have time, and I'll describe this one. OK, so that's the difficulty of the problem. Um, there, it's hard because there are so many metrics and because some of them are weird and hard to picture. And in, in addition to these, there are probably weirder metrics that are undiscovered. Um, OK, so the, the main subject of my talk, my talk is called Metaphors in Systolic Geometry. And the, um, so the, the, what I want to do, so there are three different proofs of the systolic inequality that we know that are kind of really different from each other. And each one of them is based on a metaphor that connects this problem to some other problem that at first looks quite different and about which mathematicians have already known a great deal. And so um, each of the proofs is guided by this metaphor. You say this problem is sort of like this other problem, and it tells you how you should go. Um, so I want to explain to you those three metaphors and how they help to attack the problem, how, in particular, how to get started. So I'm not going to be able to give any complete proof of the systolic inequality. But for each metaphor, I want to go far enough that you can see that we have a, a way to proceed. OK. So the first metaphor is from geometric measure theory. And the, it is the thing that's the nice theorem there is called the Goering link conjecture, which is a theorem. And it was, I'll tell you in a bit who proved it. And it says the following thing. If I have z and w, which are linked cycles in Rn, um, 
And if the volume of z is the same as the volume of an n-dimensional round sphere of radius r, then the distance between z and w is less than or equal to r. So let me draw a picture to explain what this means. OK, so I have a cycle z that I'll draw in pink. And then there's another cycle w, which is linked with it. W. So in the, in the picture, these are one-dimensional cycles sitting in R3. And linked means uh, like, you know, like when two rings are linked and the magician pulls them apart, that kind of linked. Um, and this has a natural generalization to higher dimensions. And 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 1 less than 3. And that condition on the dimensions generalizes it. OK, so that's what it means to be linked cycles. And then my next assumption is that the volume of z is the same as an n-dimensional round ordinary sphere of the radius r. So in particular, I know something about the volume of z. So I've drawn it relatively small. I don't know anything about the volume of w, so I drew it quite big. And the conclusion is that the distance from z to w is less than or equal to r. And what that means, in other words, is that there's some point w on w and some point z on z. And this distance here is less than r. That's what the conjecture means. So for example, z could actually be a uh, n-dimensional sphere of radius r, which is basically what I drew. And then w could be another sphere or something which is linked with it. And it could go right through the center of z. And then the distance between w and z would actually be r. That shows you can't do any better than this. And then if you take that picture where w is a nice big sphere linked with this little sphere, and you start to jiggle, say, say you jiggle w around, um, it's going to have to go pass through there somewhere. And so going through the center is the best thing. And you can start to jiggle z around as long as you don't make its volume bigger. And it's at least tempting to believe that since you can't make its volume bigger, you can't stretch it in every direction. So maybe you stretch it in this direction, and it pinches in that direction, and that doesn't help you. Um, anyway, that's some intuition why this is a plausible conjecture. OK. Um, now, this is, as I said, a theorem. So it was proven, um, it was proven by Bombieri, Enrico Bombieri, uh, who's here, and Leon Simon in the early 70s. And it uses minimal surface ideas. So one of their ideas is to look at the minimal surface whose boundary is z and use some nice properties of minimal surfaces um, to, to, well, to prove this theory. OK. OK. So that's a nice result. And I'm going to try to make an analogy between, between the gehring link problem and the systolic inequality. Um, OK. Um, so let me make a list of what might be analogous to what. And then I'll mention something that's quite different and which is, which is a, an issue. So I'll make a little list of similarities and differences between these inequalities. OK. So um, our n-dimensional torus with this metric g is going to correspond to the cycle z. And that's. That's sensible because they're, well, I've arranged that they're both little n-dimensional because I was looking ahead. And in both cases, we know something about their volume. So that's good. Um, OK. Um, that seems to suggest that we should say that the distance from z to w on this side should correspond somehow to the systole of Tng. It's a little bit less clear how that's going to happen. 
Um, but one, th one thing that makes it look uh, like a little bit of a plausible analogy is that these are both in units of length. So they at least have the right units to be compared to each other. That, <laughs> that doesn't sound that impressive, but it's a some kind of serious point. Right? So, so if you're trying to prove Lovner's theorem that I've erased, you're trying to relate a one-dimensional length and a two-dimensional area. And uh, I was just reading over last week Polya's book about how to solve math problems. And he says, you should, the first thing you should do is you should try to think of a theorem that in, involves the, sim, the same unknown that you're trying to deal with and involves the same kind of ingredients. So you go to look up theorems that involve a length and an area. Yeah. And there are plenty of them. And then you have a lot of tools, and, and you can prove Lovner's inequality. <laughs> OK. But the systolic inequality in higher dimensions relates a length and, say, a three volume. So if you want to do this, you have to go to your, your geometry books and try to locate theorems that involve a length and a three volume. And there are not so many of them anymore. This really gets cut down a lot. And this is one of near the top of the list. OK. So, so this maybe should correspond like that. We're going to try to build this analogy. And then we have a, an important difference. But um, on this side, what we have is an abstract Riemannian manifold which is not sitting in Rn. And on this side, we have a cycle Z, which is sitting in Rn. And it's crucial that it's sitting in Rn. The statement of what we're trying to prove would not make any sense if it wasn't sitting in Rn, where it had this other thing that was linked with it. Um, OK. So in the original proof of the systolic inequality, Gromov took this route. And he got around this issue by embedding the Riemannian manifold Tng in some vector space. So Gromov used the Kuratovsky embedding. Um, at the turn of the century, Kuratovsky realized that any metric space, maybe compact metric space, say, can be embedded isometrically into a Banach space, um, not into Euclidean space, but into a Banach space. Um, and so the way you do it is we want to embed TNG into a Banach space. And the most convenient one to choose is L infinity of TN, the space of Lebesgue integrable, well, Lebesgue bounded functions on the torus. And the way the mapping goes is you take a point x in the torus, and you send it to the function. Oh. Yeah, that's true. OK. That's a good point. OK, so to formulate this, we should have some non-contractible loops. Otherwise, there's nothing to prove. But a, an example um, where things don't work out very well is S1 cross S2. So in this example, um, we could have a very long S1 crossed with a, a small S2. And in this way, we could arrange that the three-dimensional volume of this thing is around epsilon. And the systole of this thing is very, very big. Um, now, um, OK, now you might say it would be natural to try to prove some other inequalities about S1 and S2. Maybe that relates this length and that area and so on. Um, and so there, there is a longer story there if you, if you look for other inequalities. Um, but, but for just the systolic inequality, um, you need to have a kind of hefty fundamental group. Um, for the torus, this is kind of saying that the manifold Tn is big in all directions. right? At least, it's, I mean, it's not precise, but at least in the sense that a loop going around in any of the possible ways a loop could go around has to be pretty big. And so being big in all these different directions is going to make the volume big. And if the fundamental group is a little bit less important, the manifold is kind of just big that way. Um, Yeah, yeah. 
That's a good question. Um, so I, will, I would answer it um, this way. So if your manifold admits a non-negative curvature metric, then that implies that your manifold is a k pi 1. And that's enough to, imp that, that implies that m obeys the systolic inequality. So Gromov really proved this more general thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so any k pi 1, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. OK. Um, so the Kuratowski embedding sends the point x to the function, which is the distance from x to dot. So the function is supposed to take any variable. You stick it in the dot, and you get a number. So that's, so that's that function. Um, and this is an isometry in the sense that the distance in the torus between x and y is equal to the L infinity norm of k of x minus k of y. So it preserves distances. It's an isometry. OK. So using this, you can stick uh, your torus inside of an infinite dimensional vector space. That doesn't quite match with our linked cycles, because linked cycles are only defined in a finite dimensional vector space. But that's a minor point. Um, so instead of using every point here, we can just use some finite list of points, x1 up to x capital N. And then we get a map k1 from our Ramanian torus into, um, well, the space R capital N with the L infinity metric. And it's not quite an isometry anymore, but if you take enough points, it's very close to an isometry. So it obeys the inequality that the distance from x to y is at most uh, you know, 1.1 times k of x minus k of y L infinity. And it's at least 0.9 times k of x minus k of y. Um, OK, so it's nearly an isometry. And this n depends on the metric. Yeah, warning. <laughs> this n depends on the metric. Yeah. Yes, very good. OK. Um, so um, this uh, z, my z is going to be k1 of the torus. And that means that since my mapping was nearly an isometry, the volume of z is at least close to the volume of the torus. Um, so that top line is set up well. OK. Um, Um, so the first kind of clever step in, in Gromov's proof is that um, so there actually exists some W contained in Rn L infinity, which links with Z, which links with Z, and the distance between Z and W um, is at least one tenth of the systole. Of TNG. Okay, so this is very clever, um, but not not that long. And to manage my time, I'm not going to be able to tell you how he did it. Um, um, but suppose we have this for a second. Um, then we have our Z and W linked inside of this Banach space with this large dimension that we have no control over, and we know how big Z is. Um, and then we would like to use the Goering link conjecture. So we're now set up so that there's a good close analogy between the systolic inequality and the Goering link conjecture. Namely, 
sharing link conjecture, if it was true in this Bonox space, would imply um, that the volume of z is greater than or equal to, say, to the 1 over n, is greater than or equal to some constant times the distance from z to w, which in turn is greater than or equal to some constant times the systolic inequality, the, sy the systole of Tng. Um, so that's a kind of progress, because at the beginning we wanted to prove the systolic inequality, which was not very much like anything we've proven before. And by following this road, we get to the point where we want to prove the Goering link conjecture in this Banach space, which feels quite close to the original Goering link conjecture in the Euclidean space, and you can start trying to adapt the proof and trying to do different things. Yes, that's right. Yeah. OK. So I think that's as much as I have time for about that metaphor. Um, so I'm going uh, yeah. to, it does lead to a proof. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this is the beginning of the original proof of the systolic inequality. Okay. Um, so the next metaphor that I want to tell you about um, is the connection between the systolic inequality and scalar curvature. I can argue. <laughs> OK. Um, so the second approach I want to talk to you about is an analogy between the systolic inequality and the Garrosh conjecture, which is in the about, about scalar curvature. So the, the Garrosh conjecture says that the torus Tn admits no metric of positive scalar curvature. This time it may be clear where the torus comes in. <laughs> yeah, uh, good. That's one important point. So, okay, so the, the n equals 2 case of the Garrosh conjecture follows from the Gauss Bonnet theorem, which says that the integral over the two torus of the scalar curvature, I'll put it this way, is equal to 0, and therefore the scalar curvature cannot be strictly positive. But getting from the three-dimensional case is, is a lot harder, and that was an open problem for a long time. Um, I think that there's a little bit of an analogy between this Garrosh conjecture becoming harder when you hit three dimensions and the systolic inequality being harder. OK, so, th so this has been proven. Um, uh, that sounds like it would be a more recent way of proving it. Um, so n equals 3 was proven by Shane and Yao in uh, 1976. And then n equals 3 was the breakthrough point. After that, all of the dimensions followed pretty quickly. So all n um, by Shane and Yao and Gromoff and Lawson by 1980. 
Um, and later on, there might be other groups. It's only in dimension three. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, so I want to give a little intuition about positive scalar curvature. Um, so here's, here's one way of thinking about positive scalar curvature, which is particularly is good for this talk. Um, namely, that the scalar curvature appears in the description of volumes of small balls. So. Suppose that I have a point P in a Ramanian manifold MNG, and I want to look at the, um, the volume of the ball centered at P with radius R. Well, um, to first approximation, this is the volume of the Euclidean ball of radius R, omega nR to the n. And then there are correction terms. And the biggest correction term comes from the scalar curvature. So it's minus some constant times the scalar curvature r to the n plus 2. Um, and then there are higher order terms. And this is asymptotic that holds as r gets small. So in other words, um, if the scalar curvature of g is positive everywhere, that means that um, volumes of balls, volumes of small balls, are less than Euclidean. So when people give talks about scalar curvature, I often see them use this definition because it's definitely the easiest thing to communicate to an audience that's not practiced doing scalar curvature. Um, on the other hand, uh, I've never seen this definition play any role in any actual proof of a theorem about scalar curvature. Um, OK. But for the purpose of having analogies with the systolic inequality and with things in, in metric geometry where the, the main players are volumes and lengths and so on, this is a good thing to think about. Um, so what I want to do is to take the volumes of balls as the central object of study. And scalar curvature can be kind of expressed in terms of them because of this. And I want to rewrite the Girard's conjecture in terms of volumes of balls instead of writing it in terms of scalar curvature. So let's fix a metric. Uh, on the n-torus. And then I'm going to encode some information about volumes of balls in a function v of r. v of r is defined to be the maximum of the volume of a ball of radius r. And at this point, I'm going to throw you a small curve by writing in the universal cover of t with the metric g. OK. Um, and then the Garrosh conjecture can be just rewritten as just equivalent to saying that for any metric G on the n torus um, and for small r, so there exists some r naught, and then if I look smaller than that, V of r is sub Euclidean. V of R is, sorry, V of R is at least Euclidean. So let me explain why that is equivalent. Um, suppose that I know this. Um, then I take my hypothetical metric with positive scalar curvature. Positive scalar curvature means that for some small balls, the volumes are all less than Euclidean, and that just contradicts this. Uh, so that doesn't happen, and there's no metric with positive scalar curvature. OK. Um, Um, so Gromov raised the question, what if we don't look at just very tiny r? What if we look at other values of r? And if you play around a little bit, it actually looks completely plausible that this is just true for all r, and is a special case for very tiny r. Um, so let's give that a name. 
So the generalized Garish conjecture is simpler to write than the other one. It just says for every metric on a torus and for every radius, um, V of R is at least omega n r to the n, the volume of a Euclidean ball. Let me make a little picture um, that will explain maybe the universal cover and give a little intuition about this conjecture. Um, so suppose that my torus metric looks like one of the ones we considered by before, a flat torus, but then with a little finger sticking out of it. So this is g. This is T2g. Then if I look at the universal cover of that, what does that look like? Well, the flat torus I got by taking a parallelogram and gluing its sides together. So the universal cover of that looks like a bunch of parallelograms, where each parallelogram is a fundamental domain. And then, um, then there's a spike coming out of the torus. So each fundamental domain has a spike in the middle of it. So I'll draw the spikes a little smaller, because I think the picture will be less confusing. So the universal cover looks sort of like that. Um, now, if I take a little ball somewhere in here. So you could have the spikes of balls anywhere, right? Centered anywhere. Yes, right. Centered anywhere. So the maximum, what the maximum is over is the choice of center. And then, yeah. So if I take a little tiny radius, Basically, the volume of my ball is depending on the curvature. So I find a point which is uh, non-negatively curved, and I look at a little ball. And it's true by, by the standard Garish conjecture. If I take the other extreme and I look at a really big ball, it looks like this. Well, then what I get looks like the Euclidean volume of this big ball, basically, except that I've cut out some little disks and glued in some little spikes that are bigger than disks. And so this will actually be bigger than the volume of the Euclidean ball. Um, so it looks at least plausible that it's true for really big R. Um, and that explains why we have to take the universal cover. If I took a really big ball in this torus, I would just have the whole torus, and certainly it wouldn't be bigger than omega n r to the n. But over here, it looks reasonable that that might be true. OK. Um, now. The connection to the systolic inequality comes from considering a medium-sized ball here. Not when r is really huge, and not when r is really small, but when r is around the systole. Namely, I could choose r to be 1 half of the systole of Tng. Um, then I'll get a ball that looks roughly like so. In particular, this, this restriction Maybe I can put minus epsilon. This restriction that the radius is a little bit less than half of the systole means that that ball lies in one fundamental domain if I draw my fundamental domains right. So then the ball around x naught of radius r lies in one fundamental domain. And that ball corresponds to a ball downstairs, one to one, because it lies in one fundamental domain. Um, so I conclude that there exists um, a ball x naught, well, pi of x naught of radius r um, downstairs with the volume estimate that the volume of this ball is at least omega n r to the n. And I plug in what r is, and this is at least around, well, some constant times the systole of Tng to the 1 over uh, to the n. OK. And that's the volume of some ball sitting in my torus. So that's, of course, less than or equal to the volume of the torus. And that's the systolic inequality. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good point. So this is adapted from Minkowski's lemma on lattices. OK, good. So this is not a proof of the systolic inequality yet, because that was a conjecture and not a theorem. <laughs> this is one of my favorite conjectures in geometry, because it's so simple to state. You know, the, my kind of beef with Riemannian geometry is you take a Riemannian geometry course, and you learn 600 pages of definitions. And then you say, am I ready for an interesting question? And your advisor gives you 300 pages of definitions. <laughs> but instead, you could just read the first page, and you could look at this question. Uh, however, my beef with this question is that I have absolutely no idea what to do. <laughs> uh, okay. But there, there is um, some partial progress which you could also take as, as some evidence that maybe that's true. Uh, so, so there's a theorem of myself that this is true, but with the wrong constant. For every metric on an n-dimensional torus, for every radius r, v of r is at least some constant c, depending on m, times r to the n where the cn is less than what we want, omega n, but bigger than 0. It and it doesn't depend on g, yeah. Independent of g. Yeah. Closer to that one. If I remember it, the problem is not so bad. Yeah, it's not so bad. Um, so, um, so this is like roughly like n to the minus n. It doesn't maybe at first sound not so bad, but you should remember that omega n is itself only like n to the minus n over 2. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So yeah, yeah, so if we, if we go back to the systolic inequality, then um, because it's written a little bit differently, um, the cn, so uh, my cn there is 8n. Um, the original Gromov cn is something like n to the n. And the conjectural right answer is something like n to the 1 half. Uh, or if you're not brave, I'm not maybe brave enough to make this conjecture, but it's at least, it's definitely not less than that. Sorry? Oh, uh huh. Okay, right. So, okay. So it's the asymptotic should be some important constant. What's the letter? So the, it's, so I'll call it h times n to the one half. And then you're saying, and then, and then, and okay. So uh, it should sort of go to this, and then, and and then, the value of h is an important open problem. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so it sounds like for lattices, this thing is pinched between two constants times n to the 1 half, and one would like to get it better. And for curved metrics, it's pinched between a constant n to the 1 half and a different constant times n. Which, hey, so that's how it is. No. Yeah. OK. Um, Uh, in dimension two, that's true by uniformization. Um, and otherwise, I don't, I don't know how to prove that. 
um, um, for an extremo metric. There's some w w kind of weak. Yeah, so Gromov proved a, a weak monotonicity theorem for extremo metrics, which would say that balls grow at least like some constant r to the n, but not as good as what you have in Euclidean space for minimal surfaces. Um, OK, so in, my, in, in the last 10 minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about how this proof works. Um, it, it works by imitating the Shane and Yao proof of the uh, Garrosh conjecture. So so let me give you a one-minute summary of how Shane and Yao proved the Garrosh conjecture for a three-dimensional torus. Um, so they did it by studying minimal surfaces in the torus, and they observed a stability lemma. Um, it says that um, if you have a three manifold with positive scalar curvature, and then if you take some surface sigma, which um, uh, so which is a stable minimal surface, and if, then, if you don't know what that is, it might help for me to say that, for example, you take the smallest area homologically non-trivial surface, homologically non-trivial surface, so if you have this nice minimal, absolute stable minimal surface in your three-manifold, um, then this surface also has uh, scalar curvature greater than zero, fine print on average. So, roughly. Is that connected to positive mass? Um, it is connected to positive mass. Um, um, Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, uh, let me say how they prove the, uh, the Garrosh conjecture first, and then maybe I'll briefly. It's like you said. Um, so suppose that T3G had positive scalar curvature. Um, T3 has non-trivial homology classes, so I can find the smallest area non-trivial surface. It has positive scalar curvature, at least on average. But it's a two-dimensional surface, which we understand better. Having positive scalar curvature on a two-dimensional surface means it's a sphere. But spheres cannot sit. Uh, can, uh, a non-trivial surface in a three torus needs to have genus at least one. So that's the Shane and Yao proof. OK. So, we're, so um, this proof of the systolic inequality goes very similarly. We're going to look at the smallest area homologically non-trivial surface in a three torus. Um, let me take a second to explain. Well, I mean, I'll write that down. This can go up here. Here. OK. So I'm going to attack systolic inequality using a minimal surface approach. So this sigma 2 in T3 is a smallest area non-trivial surface. OK. Now, it looks very reasonable at first to try to prove the systolic inequality by induction. I have a 3 torus. I'm looking inside of it for a non-trivial curve. Maybe I should first try to find a nice 2 torus whose area is not too big. And then inside of that two torus, I already know I can find a non-trivial curve. So I look at the smallest area non-trivial surface in T3G. It might well be a two torus. Let's just assume that for argument. Um, but there's an important example that I mentioned when I was talking about weird examples that happen in three dimensions. It can happen that every non-trivial surface is really huge in area. So this sigma may have a huge area. And once you realize it has a huge area, 
then it starts to feel very unlikely that this surface is good for anything. So there's certainly no theorem that says if you just have any surface with any huge area, you can find a short curve in it. But it turns out this surface is good for something. And the right point of view about it comes from Shane and Ya. Because the stability lemma doesn't say that this minimal surface is small. It says that it has positive scalar curvature. And having positive scalar curvature is supposed to mean that balls in it are small. So um, it's also only on average that you have it. Um, um, that technicality disappears in this systolic world. Um, so the analog of stability says that, um, uh, OK, so it says that one thing that could happen uh, is that there could, there could be a curve of length um, there could be a short curve with uh, non-zero intersection number with sigma. And then we're happy because we found our system. Or, um, or the other thing that could happen is that sigma um, has small balls. So the V function of sigma for balls of radius. Um, so let me normalize and say that this thing has volume 1. I'm talking about an n torus with volume, a 3 torus with volume 1. Um, so either it has a curve with non intersection, non zero intersection number with it and length less than 100, and then we're happy. Or um, this thing is quite small. So the total area of this surface sigma may be large, but the balls in the surface are quite small. And it might typically look sort of like this. It has a nice, reasonably sized torus with a lot of little tubes and balloons sticking out of it. It has many of those. Um, and one, this key scale, this is around two. So, um, so you have a metric like this. Um, the, the total volume is very large because there are many of these balls. But nevertheless, its geometric structure forces it to have a non-contractible curve, which is not too long. And it's not that hard to prove it um, because it's a two-dimensional example. Um, OK. And this is, this is what comes out of basically line for line following. Not quite line for line, but just following the Shane Yao stability argument and seeing what it gives you. And that's a good place for me to stop. Thank you. <laughs>